And this is a split bowl. It has a removable finial so that it's uh, somewhat decorative, but it is designed as an art piece, not something that we would call utilitarian where you're serving food out of it or something along those lines. This is the body of the project, uh, actually what started out as a bowl, and then it has a foot on it, a top, and then typically some type of finial that you put on it as a highlight. This particular one is made out of cherry and walnut. I used a piece of walnut to separate the two halves before I glued them back together. And then the top is also made out of walnut. This particular one I did some uh, embellishing on. I uh, put three burn rings on it while it was still in a solid bowl form. I came back and textured between these two rings with a Dremel tool and just a burr bit. And I actually just bumped the wood, you know, hundreds of times as I went around the circle, uh, creating a little bit of a texture, came back and lightly sanded it, and then painted it. This next ring is pierced. I laid out a pattern that I liked, and then I used a Dremel tool uh, and pierced these different designs in it. And of course I did that on both sides while it was still a solid piece. Once I was satisfied with that, then I cut the bowl in half and then glued it back together. I'll explain that process here in just a few minutes. Here are some other examples of work that I did. Uh, this one is a good bit smaller and I found that uh, turning a smaller one is uh, actually a little more fun and uh, you don't have some of the same problems that you have on a larger piece like this. Uh, this one started out, this is actually maple. Uh, it does have uh, some curl to it. Um, I was hoping that it would highlight just a little bit better than it did when I dyed it, but uh, you had to get really close to see it. One of the nice things about these kind of projects is you can put any kind of foot on it that you like. This one started out as a donut. So I turned a donut, I cut it in half, saved the other half for a future project. And then I used a chestnut ebonizing lacquer uh, to color it black. I used that lacquer for the top and the finial as well. Now this finial, uh, I cut out on a scroll saw and I had to put a little bit of weight on the opposite side of it so that it would stay in place. It's a little bit top heavy, but uh, it kind of is a unique piece. I really like the way that it turned out. This next one, rather than putting a foot on it, I put a pedestal just because you can do a lot of different things with them. Um, I really like the way that the pedestal looks on these. It kind of elevates them, gives them some height to it. Uh, looks nice sitting on a shelf. This one is made out of white oak. It's actually quarter sawn white oak. And uh, those of you that have done work with white oak, you know that it has a very open grain pattern to it. I chose not to fill the grain pattern. Uh, rather than filling it, I just dyed it and uh, really liked the way that it highlighted uh, those open grains. I also like the way that the flakes show up in it because it is quarter sawn. Uh, really nice piece of wood. The black, again, with uh, ebonizing lacquer, uh, really makes it highlight uh, the work that I did there. This uh, is a little bit different. I used a pedestal on it rather than a foot. Uh, of course, I went ahead and put the uh, finial on it. This is a piece of uh, quarter sawn white oak. White oak has a very open grain to it, and you can see that, um, especially if you were to look a little bit closer, if you could get up closer, I'll put a, a still shot in the video so that you can see that as well. But uh, I really like the way that it turned out with the dye. This is a ink-based alcohol dye, uh, alcohol ink, and uh, I found it at Hobby Lobby. The color is turquoise, but it just gives you another option as to what you can do. And for those of you that really enjoy doing the segmented work, 
I made this one uh, just to show that you could uh, create these same types of art pieces with uh, segmented work. This one started out as a eight pointed star. The star is made out of purple heart and then the rest of the bowl is made out of maple. When I got through turning the rough shape of the bowl, I decided that I wanted to put this black ring in it to kind of highlight uh, and separate the, the two different uh, pieces of the segment. And so I cut that with a thin parting tool uh, about a sixteenth of an inch deep, just slightly deeper. And then I came back and filled it with epoxy that I mixed some black dye in. Let that set up overnight and then I turned it down flush. When I got ready to glue the two halves together, I sandwiched a piece of black veneer in between the two halves. And then I also put a piece of black veneer across the top before I glued the top on. And so it just kind of uh, highlights uh, some different aspects of it. Um, so, uh, no matter what kind of turning you like to do, you can find this as a challenge. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, what we're going to do now is get set up so that we can go ahead and get started with the demo. Let's get ready to glue our blank up for our bowl. I've cut this piece of white oak in half. I put some lines on it so that I can orient the pieces as they uh, were cut. And what we're gonna do is just butt these two halves together like this. We're gonna glue it, put clamps on it, and uh, let's set it aside for our project. I'm using uh, Type Bond 3, but any wood glue would be adequate for this project. Okay. Got that smeared on really well. I'm going to put this in my clamp, my table clamp. Then I'm going to use a couple of parallel clamps to hold it uh, flat so that it doesn't buckle on me when I put my bar clamps on it. I put a piece of tape on these parallel clamps to prevent glue from sticking to the wood so that they're easy to remove and clean up when we're done. So I get that one side clamped securely, flip it over, and then we'll go ahead and put our other parallel clamp on. This is going to help me hold it really flat while the glue dries. Take a bar clamp and just with a little bit of pressure secure the joint. I'm going to wipe off my excess glue just to make clean up a little bit easier. And then we'll set that aside to dry. Now that our piece is dried, we're going to use a long straight edge to mark our centers, going from diagonal to diagonal. And then I'm going to use my scratch all to mark the very center point where those two lines intersect. It should also be in line with the uh, two halves as I glued them up. The next thing I'm going to do is take my compass and set it to the desired radius. And I'm going to maximize my cut here. I want to use as much of this piece as I possibly can. So I'm going to uh, scribe a line and then I'm going to go to the bandsaw and cut that out. We're at the bandsaw now. I'm going to uh, cut just to the outside of my line and then get ready to mount it on the lathe. Now before I turn the machine on, I do want to mention uh, shop safety. 
and uh, want to remind you to always wear eye protection. When you're uh, working around uh, a lot of dust, it's advisable to wear a dust mask as well. And then when we start turning on the lathe, we'll wear a face shield. So make sure that you're taking care of yourself when you're working around power equipment. We're ready to put our uh, double-sided tape on our face plate. I suggest that you uh, make sure that you clean it so that you have no dust particles that would prevent the tape from adhering. I'm using denatured alcohol to clean that with. It dries very quick and then I can get a good secure bond with my double-sided tape. So I'm gonna put a piece down the center. Cut it to length. And then I'm gonna put a piece on either side of that one. And that should give us enough contact to hold our piece secure. Put a live center in my tail stop. I'll bring it up close and then we'll go ahead and get this mounted. So I've got my center point that I used to scribe my circle. I'm going to line it up on my live center and then I'm going to bring it into place, lock my tail stock, and then I'm going to put pressure against the workpiece with my tailstock. I want to let that set for three to five minutes to make sure that that uh, tape does bond really well. But all the turning that I'm going to do initially is going to be with my tailstock in place so everything is secure. I've got my speed set at 1200 RPMs. I'm going to use my bowl gouge and just true up the outside edge. Okay, I check it to make sure that I've got it perfectly round. Now that it's round, I'm gonna turn my tool rest so that I can access the uh, top of the bowl, the outside of the bowl. And again, that's gonna be on the headstock side. So what I wanna do here is put a gentle curve from the center to the outside. I wanna round it all the way to this lip right here. Um, Again, this is personal preference as to the shape. Uh, it's going to be a very shallow bowl, but I'm going to round this entire edge off right here, this corner off, uh, until I get down to this. So I'll show you the process. I've repositioned my tool rest so that I can work on the inside of the bowl. It's very important that the outside edge of the bowl remains flat. So I'm gonna true it up first, about a quarter of an inch or so, and then I'll start my recess into the center point. I am going to leave my uh, tailstock pulled up, secure to the workpiece, 
until I get this primarily hollowed out the way that I want it. And then for that last little nub, I'll go ahead and remove it. I've got this outside edge trued up. I will actually use a straight edge to check it before I take it off the lathe, but I can't do that with my live center in place. So I'm gonna go ahead and start hollowing this out just like we would do a traditional bowl. You do want to stop and periodically check the thickness of the wall of the bowl. You want to, uh, it, it really doesn't matter how wide you leave it as long as the top is going to be glued on. If you're going to make the top uh, a lid rather than a glued on top, then it would matter how thick the walls are and you'd want to make sure that you had it finished out so because people will be looking inside it. So I'm going to go ahead and take a measurement with the caliper and see where I'm at. Now I'm still about three eighths of an inch thick right there. So I've got a lot of wood to remove. I've got it cut down to uh, the desired depth that I want. What I'm gonna do now is uh, back my tailstock off and then I'm gonna nibble away at that uh, little piece I've got there in the center still. And then we'll get ready to uh, mount it to another face plate. Always recommend that you go ahead and remove the uh, live center so that you don't get your elbow on that little sharp point right there. Before I mount my face plate to the inside of this or my, my little uh, waste block, I do want to double check the outside to make sure that it is perfectly flat so that we'll have a glue, good glue joint when we put the two halves together. I'm going to use a straight edge, measure across the outside, and I do have a good tight fit on both sides, so it's going to work. I put some denatured alcohol on my shop towel and I'm going to uh, clean the dust off of this face and we're going to be using double sided tape to mount another face plate right here on the center so that we can reverse this. I've got my face plate and waste block mounted on a revolving live center that goes in my tailstock. I've also put double face tape on there. We're going to slide this up, lock our tailstock in place, and then I'm going to uh, put pressure against the inside of the bowl 
so that that uh, double-sided tape will secure to the inside of the bowl. We'll let that set for a few minutes and then we will take it off the lathe and reverse it. I've got a piece of 120 grit sandpaper right here that I'm going to start with. I'm going to use a foam backing pad so that uh, it doesn't build up too much heat on my hand, but I also like the flexibility of the foam pad so it'll roll around the edge. We'll sand uh, with uh, four grits as we uh, get ready to finish it out. With that fine sanding dust, I've decided to go ahead and uh, put my dust collection back in place. This is 400 grit. Before we take this off the lathe, I'm going to put my live center back in my tailstock. I'm going to pull it into place and I'm going to just gently bring my tailstock up and mark a divot right in the center of the bowl. That's helping me locate that center point so I can draw a line across it to saw it in half. I'm also going to use some compressed air to blow out all that sawdust that's in those open grains. By the way, if you don't use this, you can pick this up at Sam's. It comes in a four pack and it's relatively inexpensive. It lasts a long time, but it also has a lot of pressure to it. So it's good to use for cleaning up around your shop. This piece is ready to come off the lathe now. I've got my center point marked. I'll show you how I'm gonna mark my line in just a minute but I'm just going to start applying some gentle pressure around the outside rim of the bowl to start breaking that tape loose. Once we get it started then, it generally comes off pretty easy. We're ready to mark our center line. I've got that little divot that I made with the uh, live center in the tailstock. I've got a flexible tape measure or ruler here that I can roll over the edges and you can see that I've already scribed a line. I'm just gonna go back and darken that a little bit. And we'll take it to the bandsaw and saw it in half. Okay, we're here at the bandsaw. I'm gonna saw it in half and then show you the next steps. <laughs> We've got our bowl cut in half. We put the two halves together like this, and that's going to form the body of our split bowl. Now, before we glue this up, if you decided that you wanted to put some veneer in here, now would be the time to do that. I've got some uh, examples of some veneer here. I bought this when one of the either Woodcraft or Craft Supply had it on sale several months ago and I bought some while it was on sale. It comes in different colors. Uh, of course this black is dyed black. Um, some other options would be to resaw your own or Varsity Bookstore or University Bookstore has uh, these uh, 
I guess the art students use this, architectural students use it at the university and they sell this and you can go pick some of this up. It works great for veneer like we're doing. Uh, I bought this thinking that I would try to dye it different colors to see how that would turn out, but I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. But you can go pick this up, fairly inexpensive, or like I say, you can make your own. And so I glued up this walnut. And you can see it's just segmented pieces of walnut. Uh, it was three quarters of an inch thick after I glued it up. And then I took it to the bandsaw and resawed it and I got three pieces out of it. And then I was able to run it through my drum sander and sand it down to about one eighth of an inch. Uh, this one, I actually cut a little bit thinner. And this one is the one that I cut the veneer for that uh, vase that I showed you earlier, or that split bowl made out of cherry that I showed you earlier. So we're gonna go ahead and glue this up. I'm going to uh, just spread a small amount of glue on this outside edge. And I'm going to go ahead and put glue on both sides since I didn't get a good coverage there. I'm not overly concerned about any squeeze out to the inside because it's not going to be seen once we put the bowl together. Two halves together. Make sure that they're lined up properly. The better you get it lined up, the less sanding you have to do a little later. I'm just going to use painter's tape, one strip in the center to hold it secure make any necessary adjustments. So I want to make sure that the uh, radius out here lines up perfectly. Not so concerned about this edge up here because I'm going to have access to it to sand it. If I start sanding on this over here, then I'm going to uh, destroy the shape that I've got. Typically, uh, three pieces of tape is adequate to hold it while that glue sets up. We'll set that aside and get ready for the next step. While we're waiting for our glue to set up on our bowl, I'm going to go ahead and lay out the lid or the top. I'm going to use this piece of walnut, but you can use maple or any contrasting wood. Uh, you could actually use white oak if you chose to, but I like a contrasting wood to uh, just kind of make it highlight a little bit. So what I'm going to do is lay my bowl on here parallel to the edge. And I'm going to move it over pretty close to one edge because it's a whole lot easier to cut or sand that away than having to uh, sand a bunch. I'm going to use my pencil to mark the outside shape. And then while I've still got the bowl in place, I'm just gonna put a small mark right there where that center point is or that glue line is. And I wanna do that on both ends. Now, a trick that I wanted to show you real quick, if you decided to make this a lid, so that lift it off and you wanted it to overhang the edges just a little bit, you can lay your piece of wood out like this and take a washer that is the width that you want your overhang to be. You can use it then to trace around the outside and give yourself a line to cut to. Now this washer is actually probably a little bit big for this particular project, but you get the idea. You could purchase a washer the size that you needed so that you could get a layout line that matched the contour of the bowl. 
So flip it back over to this side where I made my marks. I'm going to take my center rule now and I'm going to line up on those two end points that I made so that I can find the exact center. The first thing I want to do is scribe a line that marks the center. And then I'm going to uh, line up my zero point as close to center as possible. Now what I'm actually looking at is my measurements on each end so that I can see what my measurement is and I'm gonna split the difference. So down here on this end, I've got three and a half. Right here, I've got three and five eighths. So that tells me that it must be about three and nine sixteenths to the center point. Okay. All right, I've got it lined up. It's three and five eighths on each end. I'm gonna mark my center. And then I'm gonna use a square to square that line across. And this is simply a reference line for me. Uh, my next step is going to be to bore the hole that I need uh, for my finial. And to determine what size finial I can make, I want to measure the distance between the two walls. You do not want to make the hole bigger than this gap right here. So I've got a gap of seven eighths of an inch, so I'm gonna drop down to uh, three quarters of an inch. So I'm gonna drill a hole right here, three quarters of an inch. So let's mark this and uh, go to the drill press. Here we are at the drill press. I've installed a three quarter inch Forstner bit. I've got my piece of wood lined up under the bit, centered, and I've got a waste block so that I don't blow out the back side of this top piece. Gently drill my hole. Okay, so we've got our hole drilled. Next step is to go to the bandsaw and cut our outside line. We're back at the bandsaw. When I get ready to cut this line, I wanna make sure that I stay slightly to the outside of the line, but the closer I am to the line, the less sanding I have to do later. So you wanna make a nice clean cut, but you do not wanna cut the line so that it's too small. Our glue has had adequate time to uh, set up on our bowl. So what I want to do now is sand this surface right here, the top of the bowl flush. And uh, I'm going to do that on my rigid oscillating sander. If you haven't used one of these, uh, I highly recommend them. Um, Alan Carter, who demonstrates these and makes a lot of them, uh, he talked about how he uses these on a daily basis or uses his on a daily basis. And uh, I started doing a little research, decided to go ahead and buy one, and it is a very good investment. I added a little uh, fence to mine so that I can run a piece all the way down it and uh, get a good clearance and uh, don't get snipe on it quite as bad as I would without the fence. So uh, just a little modification I made. I do have my dust collector or my shop vac hooked up to it, so it's going to kick on. It's going to be a little noisy. I'll try to mute that in the video. We're ready to glue our top onto the bowl. I took a little time to find my center points on the outside of the bowl. And if you recall, we made a center line across the bowl when we 
laid out the hole. So when I put this on there, I want to make sure that I've got these center lines lined up as close as possible. And then I want to also make sure that my center line running lengthwise is lined up as close as possible. That'll make sure that, or ensure that the hole is centered in the bowl. Uh, I'm just going to spread a thin layer of glue around the lip. And again, we'll use uh, painter's tape to hold the lid on the bowl while it's setting up. And I put a little too much glue. So I get rid of a little bit of that. Not only am I checking my alignments, but I'm also checking to make sure that the top overhangs the bowl so that I can sand it down flush if uh, I wind up not getting it in a position where it's overhanging then it's going to create a lot of problems when I get ready to put to, to finish it out and sand it. So I like that position right there. I'm going to take a piece of tape and start in the center and work to the outside. And again, I'm just get, holding it secure for the glue to set up. Put a little pressure down on it while that glue is setting up enough to uh, prevent it from sliding, moving. Double check everything, make sure you're satisfied with the alignment. And you should be good to go. Now I happen to have a giant rubber band that I like to put on there just to give it a little clamping pressure Although it's not necessary, uh, I just feel more comfortable with a little bit of pressure applied. So uh, I'm going to throw that on there. We'll set that aside and let the glue set up. While we're waiting for the glue to set up on our top, we're going to go ahead and lay out a piece for the foot. I've got a piece of walnut right here. And uh, what I'm going to do is use this tin can to strike a radius or an arc for my uh, foot. So I'm just going to get it in position not really worrying about any measurements at this point. Uh, now once I get that, then I'm going to go ahead and uh, make a square line. I'll cut that off and then we'll use this piece for the finial. But this is going to be the basic shape of the foot. We're gonna to go to the bandsaw and make this cut. We've got this piece cut out for the foot. What I want to do now is put a slight uh, angle on the outside edges. And so I've tilted my bandsaw table uh, to an angle that I think will look good. I'm going to run this piece through on this edge and then I'll turn it around and run it through on the other edge. Now, 
I am going to use a push stick so that I do not have to get my fingers in there close to the bandsaw blade. So think safety as you're making this cut. We're at the sander, and I'm gonna sand this arc right here, as well as the two edges that we just cut that chamfer on. Now, I got a little over anxious when I was making this arced cut at the uh, bandsaw. What I should have done is made this cut, brought it to the sander, sanded that arc out smooth prior to cutting these angles. Uh, to compensate for that, I've taken one of the pieces that I cut off I've used some double-sided tape as well as some painter's tape to hold it in place. And I laid it on my table and put a square on it to make sure I had a good 90 degree angle right there. So I'm going to sand my arc first. Then I can come back, sand this side, remove that waste piece, and sand that other side at the angle that I cut. Off camera, I went ahead and uh, sanded this down uh, to 400 grit. Ease the edges on it so I don't have any sharp edges or corners. What I want to do now is I want to locate a center point up here to drill a hole. We're going to drill a 1 8 inch hole in case we decide to use a little piece of this brass rod to mount our foot to our bowl. Um, I like to drill a small hole first, and if we decide we want to use a quarter inch dowel or something like that, we can always enlarge the hole. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now what I found to be the easiest thing to do as far as marking the center is using my flexible ruler. If you don't have one of these, I picked this one up at Hobby Lobby, but you can also find them possibly at some of the other stores in town. Uh, if your wife or some of you ladies out there may have uh, some sewing uh, tapes that are flexible. They work really well for measuring radiuses like this. So what I want to do is start on the outside edge. I'm just going to roll around my piece and guess at what I think is going to be the center point. And I'm going to start with about two and seven eighths. Make a mark there. And then I'm going to measure back this direction and see if that two and seven eighths is going to work for me. Okay, so you can see how close they are to being lined up. I think that I can eyeball it from there and uh, split the difference. So I'm gonna say the center point is going to be about right there. And then I'm going to use uh, my little combination square right here to find the exact center widthwise. So I've got it marked there just to guess 
at where it's going to be. I put one layout mark there and another. And then again, I'm going to split the difference. So between those two lines and on that center line should be my center point. So I'm going to mark that with my all. I'm going to put a 1 8 inch drill bit in the drill press and we're going to bore that hole. I've put a 1 8 inch drill bit in my drill press. Got my piece lined up. We're ready to drill the hole. I didn't really measure a depth for the hole. Uh, I just drilled deep enough that I know it will be secure if I put if I do decide to use the brass rod. Uh, gives me enough surface to glue, and then I'll leave it a little bit long so it'll uh, go up into the bowl when we get ready to drill the hole there. Hey, I've got the other piece of that uh, block that I had that I cut the foot out of. I'm going to use it for my finial. So I'm going to start by marking my center points. And uh, thanks to Michael for the centering jig. This is uh, one of his 3D printed center finders. Because my block is not exactly square, I'm going to go ahead and mark it. Uh, all the way around and then I'll be able to find the exact center point by splitting the difference. So you can see that those lines don't uh, go exactly from corner to corner because this is not a square. So I'm just going to find the center point in between the lines and that will certainly be close enough for us to put this between centers on the lathe. I've got my blank for the finial uh, chucked up on the lathe, turning between centers. I'm going to rough this blank out with a inch and a quarter bowl gouge. And I'm gonna turn at a pretty high speed. It won't take long to knock this out. So I'm turning at about 1200. I've got it round. The next thing I want to do is turn a uh, tenon to fit in my four jaw chuck. I've got a dovetail chuck, so I'm just going to cut about a 3 16 inch tenon here. It's almost small enough that I don't need to take any more uh, of the diameter off of it. I'm just going to go ahead and turn a tenon. Our blank is about four and a quarter inches long. I want the tenon to be approximately three inches tall, so I'm going to measure from this end back toward the headstock three inches, put a mark there, and that will be the bottom of our finial, and then I'm going to want the finial to recess into the piece 
uh, the remaining distance. So I'll just part it off right down here when I'm done. So this wood right here is going to need to be three quarters of an inch diameter to fit the hole that we cut in our lid. I'm gonna start by wasting away some of this wood, get it down to uh, my finial size, and then I'll come back and cut this down uh, based on the width of the top. Turned off the lathe to drop my tool rest down just a little bit. I'll continue wasting away wood. Okay, I've got some wood wasted away so that I can go ahead and start shaping my finial now. This will be the top of the finial. Again, the base will be right here, and then this will be what fits into the hole that we cut in our top. So I'm gonna start with a skew and just start tapering this end down uh, so that I can put a little uh, point on the tip of my finial. I've gone ahead and removed my tailstock so that I can have access to the very tip. I want to start from the top and work my way down with my design. I went ahead and did most of the finial work off camera. I've started rough sanding it. What I want to do now before I finish sanding it is go ahead and go down here to this base piece and I'm going to reduce it down to that three quarter inch diameter that we need to fit the hole. I'm going to start with my parting tool, establish the three quarters and then I'll go with a 
a wider tool to remove the rest of the stock. We're very close right there, so I'm going to go ahead and carry that cut out the rest of the way, and then uh, we'll sand that as we work through the process. got the finial shape like I want it. I've done some rough sanding. I'm ready to go through the grits now. I'll uh, show you a little bit of this, but I don't want to bore you too much uh, with the sanding process on camera. So I'll just show you a little bit of what I'm going to do. I cut my sandpaper into strips like this. It's really handy for uh, making pins and uh, sanding pins down. And uh, I'll just cut an entire sheet down into strips like this. I'm finished sanding my finial. I'm now going to apply some of this Axe Abrasive Sanding Paste. That's as far as I'll go with the finish because I will eventually spray ebonizing lacquer on this and it will stick better to a uh, surface finish to this point, uh, not a real slick surface. So I'm gonna stop at this point. I did use a burning wire to uh, highlight that bead right there. So now that I've got that sanding paste in there, I need to go back and clean that out. So just a little bit of pressure right there will melt it really quick. Come back with the rag, get any remaining residue, and we're ready to part it off. I've got that finial parted off. I removed that center piece of tape from our box to check fit, and it does fit nicely. Uh, it looks pretty good finished out like that with the walnut finish, but I really like the ebonized lacquer look. The, so we're gonna embellish it. This is the spray can I was referring to earlier. It's a chestnut product, but it's called ebonizing lacquer, and it does a very good job. Now, I've learned a little trick that works very well when doing this. I'll take a nail. These happen to be 16 penny nails. I'm going to put a dab of hot glue on the end of it. And then I'm going to glue my finial to the nail. Now, this is strictly temporarily. 
or temporary and it's for the purpose of painting it so I'll uh, take that then I've got a box here that I like to use to uh, hold things after I sprayed them but I'll spray lacquer on it and then I'll just put it in there to support itself and I'm going to do the same thing with this foot piece I've uh, gone ahead and cut a piece of brass rod put it in that hole that we drilled I'll spray ebonizing lacquer on it as well and then I'll push it into this box so it'll hold itself in place while the paint dries. We'll go ahead and apply the ebonizing lacquer to the finial. I don't want to get it on there so thick that it runs we'll leave it like that for now put a second coat on it in just a little while I did discover that the weight of the foot would push it down to the box and so I've come up with a different holding method here I'm gonna go ahead and spray the top then I just uh, Drilled a hole in that little block so that I can hold it in place there. So now I'll get the sides and the bottom. We'll let that set up and uh, we'll go ahead and go back to our box and uh, sand that top piece now. The glue's had adequate time to set up for the lid. We're gonna go ahead and remove the tape. And then you can see how much we're going to need to sand off. Now we're going to go back to the oscillating belt sander to remove the majority of that and then we'll have some hand sanding that we'll have to do just so that we don't damage the face and have to do a lot of additional sanding. Prior to doing that I'm going to take a piece of 180 grit sandpaper we're going to start there and I'm just going to ease around the edge right here with that 180 and basically what I'm doing is knocking off any glue squeeze out that remained and then I'm sanding it down flush to the outside lip of the bowl. I'm going to go ahead and turn the camera off while I complete this process but I'll work my way through the grits up to 400 and sand that outside smooth. Off camera I went ahead and sanded the outside of the lid flush with the sides of the bowl. I also sanded the curve right here uh, up to 400 grit. And so I've got a lot of sanding dust on it. Uh, before we mark the center hole to drill for the foot to attach, let's go ahead and clean this up with some denatured alcohol. This will give you an idea of how pretty this would be with just a natural finish if we decided to do that. So our next step is to mark the center hole so that we can go ahead and go back to the drill press and drill that 1 8 inch hole. Again, we're going to measure it just like we did on the foot piece. I've got this flexible ruler and I'm going to uh, wrap it around the edge and uh, put a mark where I'm close to the center point. In this case, it's 
about five and a half. So I'm going to mark it at five and a half, turn it around and measure from the other side to five and a half. And then we'll split the difference between those two measurements. So I'll go ahead and uh, use my awl to mark that point, and then we'll go to the drill press and drill that hole. We've got a 1 8 inch drill bit in our drill press. I've got that center marked. Let's drill that hole. We're to the point now that we're ready to put a finish on our bowl. I'm going to use some alcohol ink like I did on some of those others that you saw earlier. I bought this at Hobby Lobby. Uh, this is the packaging that it came in and you can see it costs $3.99. It only takes a couple of drops to uh, dye a piece of wood this size so uh, you can get many uses out of it. The color that I've selected is called Ultra Marine Blue and uh, we're going to do a little trial piece right here. I've already put some on an applicator pad and uh, we're going to put a little bit on here to see if we like this color. And that is uh, ultra blue for sure. So uh, I think it's gonna look good on our project when it has uh, dried a little bit and then we get a lacquer finish on top of it. And then remember that we're gonna highlight it with the black finial and the black foot. So I think that that's going to look pretty good on our project. So let's go ahead and bring our bowl into the picture and we'll go ahead and start uh, putting our finish on it. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and finish the entire thing with this blue color. After it has a couple of coats on it, then I'm going to tape off the blue and just leave this edge of the top and then I'm gonna spray it with that ebonizing lacquer. So I'm not going to uh, be too concerned about getting a little bit of the blue or a lot of the blue on that walnut at this point. So let's see what we can get. And that is a very bright blue. And I didn't mention it, but be sure and wear gloves when you're doing this because it does not wash off very easy. I'll work a little bit down into those open grains on this uh, white oak just so that it doesn't have any natural color showing through. So I'll finish up with this off camera and then we'll come back and uh, take a look at what we've got. We're back after we have put the ebonizing paint on the uh, base foot and the finial. They've had adequate time to dry. Um, while I was off camera, I also finished out the uh, box itself and uh, or the bowl. We are ready to uh, go ahead and start the assembly process. The foot has been uh, sprayed with uh, ebonizing lacquer and it's had adequate time to dry as well as the finial. They both look nice with that black color. While we were off camera, I also did some additional work on the bowl. And uh, what you saw me do last was put the dye on it. And it was a little bit bright for me, a little bit dark. And so off camera, I went back and I uh, cut it back with some acetone. And then uh, also did a little bit of sanding on it and then came back and uh, put a thin coat on it, a coat that I had thinned down considerably. And uh, I like the contrasting color that it gives me now with the open grain showing up with that dark blue 
and then a little bit of a lighter color blue on that. After I got through doing that, then I used some painter's tape and I taped off the lid, or basically I taped off the bowl and I sprayed the ebonizing lacquer on the lid. So you can see what that looks like at this point. So we are now ready to actually glue these two pieces together. And what I'm going to do is uh, use some two-part epoxy. I'll mix that up and I will put it in the hole and uh, then a little bit on the brass rod. Now in preparing for that, I took a triangular shaped file and I filed some small notches on the brass rod so that the epoxy has something to grip to so that once it sets, hopefully it will not break loose and spin freely. Uh, it is long enough that there's no chance of the bowl falling off, but I would like for the foot to remain secure once I get it epoxied in place. So I'll turn the camera off, mix my epoxy, get that applied to the brass rod and to the bowl, get it assembled, and then bring you back. Here's our completed split bowl. Hope that you uh, enjoyed the demonstration and uh, even though it's not face-to-face, uh, -face, I hope that you uh, got something out of it and maybe have been inspired to go home and try your hand at a split bowl. I'd certainly be glad to answer any questions if you have those as you start working on one. Uh, feel free to give me a call, uh, send me a text, send me an email. I'll try to get back to you quickly. Before I sign off, I would like to encourage you to spend as much time as possible with your kids and grandkids during this time that we're uh, restricted on our travel. If uh, you get to see them on a regular basis, invite them out to the shop, teach them how to uh, do some woodworking. Um, I've had an opportunity in the last two weeks to spend time with my grandkids and uh, we've done some small trucks and things like that in the shop just kind of getting them exposed to woodworking so that hopefully one day they'll want to become a wood turner as well. I'd also like to say thank you to Kent and to Christian for organizing our meeting today and for the work that they've done behind the scenes in uh, getting the Zoom set up and communicating with all of you club members out there and helping to uh, introduce you to this process.